the fact that they went to public school. 61%, 61% of the kids who are raised in a good, sound, Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church walk away once they become 18. 81% of U.S. adults believe humans evolved over time. So this origins creation is a biblical authority issue. Now those statistics are provided by the Barner Institute. And what we're going to cover today is going to be very specific in five distinct areas. The nature of the student, not ashamed of a biblical starting point, the authority of scripture and the nature of evidence, the protocols for strengthening the student in their faith, and we will conclude. Now, the nature of all of our students is that literally they have been corrupted by the lie. Say it with me, the lie. You didn't say that with conviction. Say, the lie. The lie. They have been corrupted by that in their public or charter school education. Now, although their worldview epitomizes what we call the psychological profile of the unbeliever found in Romans 1, 18 through 32. Let me stir your pure minds up about that. This is taken from the Amplified Bible. For God does not overlook sin, and the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who in their wickedness suppress and stifle the truth. So we have a conscious, willful effort by mankind to stifle and hold down the truth. Because that which is known about God is evident within them in their inner consciousness, for God made it evident to them. For ever since the creation, say creation, of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through his workmanship, that's all of his creation, the wonderful things that he has made, so that they, that's the ones who fail to believe and trust in him, are without excuse and without defense. Say with me, no excuse. When you run into somebody that says they believe in materialism, naturalism, evolutionism, they're lying. God says he has a program, even without you and me, that every single man, woman, boy, and girl on the planet knows that there's a creator God. Says here right in the scripture, you read it yourself in your hearing that they are without excuse and have no defense. For even though they knew God as the creator, they didn't honor him as God or give thanks for his wondrous creation. On the contrary, they became worthless in their thinking, godless with pointless reasonings and silly speculations. Say with me, silly, silly. Sp- Speculations. And their foolish heart was darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory and majesty and excellence of the immortal God for an image as worthless idols in the shape of mortal man and birds and four footed animals and reptiles. Say, therefore. Whenever you get into this type of spiritual situation, God always acts. And there's always a therefore. Therefore, God gave them over in the lust of their own hearts to sexual impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them, abandoning them to the degrading power of sin. Because by choice, say by choice, choice. they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Oh, you're with me now. And worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over again to degrading and vile passions. For the women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural, a function contrary to nature. And in the same way, also the men turned away from the natural function of the woman and were consumed with their desire toward one another, men with men committing shameful acts and in return receiving in their own bodies the inevitable and appropriate penalty for their wrongdoing. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God or consider him worth knowing as their creator, God gave them over to a 
depraved mind to do things which are impure and repulsive until they were filled, that is, as in permeated and saturated with every kind of, work with me now, unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, and mean spiritness. They are gossips, those are the people that spread rumors, slanderers, haters of God. You know, we had that phrase, don't be hating on me, right? Insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of new forms of evil, disobedient and disrespectful to parents. I heard you say amen out there. <laughs> Without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, without pity, although they know God's righteous decree and his judgment, yet they do it and they not only do them, but they enthusiastically approve and tolerate others who practice them. And I left out that those who do such things deserve what? I can't hear you. Did you say death? You didn't say it with conviction. Let's try that one more time. What do they deserve? Yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure you agree with what God says about that. So, this is what your students are up against. This is what they face in their educational process. People who are like that, that teach that. They have been taught evolution on the whole as truth, materialism, naturalism, on average about 35 plus hours a week. They're taught that the schools have real science and that the schools have the real facts. You and I get a chance to teach Christ as the creator what? Three plus hours maybe a week? Do the math. Just do the math. So what happens is our students have a conflict and it's hard for them to reconcile two separate worldviews. They're going to discard one because you can't hold the both. Okay? Usually the creator and his creation is the one that gets discarded, which is why over 61% of them walk away from the faith when they get to be 18. Can I get an amen? They need help, and it requires a correct understanding of God and his holiness and his infinite power. They need to be able to answer, which is why we use 1 Peter 3.15. And I'm sorry, I thought you said offense, not defense. Forgive me on that. So, they need to be able to answer the scoffers, the mockers, and the critics. And they need to understand why evolution and naturalism lack, say with me, lack scientific credibility. All right, let's take a quick look at this clip. Can we get the volume evolution on is true. Since evolution is true and Christians don't believe it, then Christians don't believe science and they aren't rational people. Really, let's put that claim to the test. First off, evolution in the sense that things change is evident. No rational person disputes that. Therefore, rational Christians believe it. We can observe change. But evolution in the sense that life came from non-life and then that life began to randomly generate new genetic information and over time it eventually produced humans is something entirely different and something that quite honestly doesn't hold up against science. In other words, evolution in the sense of molecules to man is not scientifically plausible and therefore should not be viewed as scientific fact. Quite honestly, it is in great opposition to science, that is, observational science, the kind of science we can test and repeat and use our five senses to understand. Science demonstrates that over time, Living organisms lose genetic information. They don't gain it. That same science demonstrates that life doesn't arise from non-life. Hey, we're Follow along if you would. Fact one, there is no known observable process by which new genetic information can be added to an organism's genetic code. None. That pretty much refutes evolution right away because there's no way to go from a fish to an amphibian without adding new information, right? If living organisms cannot produce new genetic information, how can anything gradually change into something of higher intelligence or form or complexity? 
That is, how can anything evolve from an amoeba to a man without adding new genetic information? The answer, of course, is that it can't, plain and simple. Now, some have speculated and they have imagined all kinds of things, and they brought in artists to produce creative renderings based on guesses, and they have been successful in telling a very convincing story that humans evolve from ape-like creatures. But those are just drawings, people. They're just stories. But what we really observe is humans are humans and apes are apes. Now, if fact one buried evolutionary thinking deep into the Precambrian soil, this next fact, fact two, tosses so much sediment on it that not even the greatest team of paleontologists with the latest subterranean gizmo could dig up the remains. Check this out. Never, again, never has it been observed that life can come from non-life. So here are two major scientific evidences against evolution. I reiterate for clarity, life has never been observed to come from non-life, and there is no known observable process by which new genetic information can be added to the genetic code of an organism. So molecules demand evolution doesn't really make scientific sense. Yet we are all here, and life is all around us in various forms. Although evolution cannot account for this, the Bible can. The Bible reveals that the all-powerful, all-knowing, supernatural God created the heavens and the earth out of nothing, and all life according to its kinds, that is, each with its own set of genetic information. So, again, what the Bible reveals makes sense of what we see and understand. Evolution does not. Enough said. <laughs> so, here's how we do this. <laughs> At the end of a clip, when he says enough said, you say enough said. But you guys say like you down at the, sorry to say, the Spectrum, the Wells Fargo Center. I'm, da I'm down. Enough said. Enough said. Enough said. You got to say with attitude. Okay. So let me repeat never, ever, ever has life been observed to come from non life. Ever. And matter does not create new genetic information. You have to add new information to the genome to go from one thing to another. And let me throw this in there also. You have to add new mechanisms to make the new stuff work. New cellular machinery, amen? Most people don't realize that the Word of God is full of science. Every time the Word of God specifically talks to a specific branch of science, it is 100% correct. It has never been proven to be an error. Just a few samples, and I'm talking about just a few, you have geology, the shape of the earth in Isaiah, gravitation, Job, glacial periods, Job, but oh, by the way, the earth is round. I've seen it for myself, up high. Biology, you have biogenesis and stability, blood circulation. How many of you, you are familiar with the Twilight Saga? Isn't there three or four movies in the Twilight movie thing? Vampires, werewolves, right? Okay. If you got bit by a wolf, what's going to happen? You're going to die. You're going to be its next dinner. Listen to me, look up here. You ain't turning into nothing but a meal, all right? If you get bitten by a bat, what do you think is gonna happen? You gonna turn into a vampire? No, you gonna catch rabies and die. Okay, these are things of fiction. Biogenesis stability means humans will always be humans, all right? And there is no such thing as the Little Mermaid, all right? I'm sorry. Disney sold you some bad hype, okay? Astronomy, long before there were Hubble telescopes and Spitzers and Chandlers and all that good stuff, God says that there were magnitudes and differences in the stars. You now know that you got brown dwarfs, you got white stars, you got yellow stars, you got blue stars, you got orange stars, you got all sorts of stars. But long before we had the equipment to see that, God said, this is how it really is. Anthropology. Anthropology is the study of man. But God says, he has made you and me in his image and his likeness. Say this with me. Will? Will. Intellect. Emotion. Emotion. That's how you are made in God's image. 
I, I, I hate to break it to you, you got none of that omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent stuff going on. But you are made like him in will, intellect, and emotion. Therefore, in the catalog of what God did in the creation week, you are the only one he says is made in his image and likeness. Everything else is made after their kind. So in other words, you got big dogs, you got little dogs, you got hairy dogs, you have, actually have naked dogs, okay? You have wolves, but they're all dogs and wolves, right? You got big cats, naked cats, furry cats, wild cat, domestic cats, but what are they? Has anybody ever seen a cog or a dat? That's a dog, cat, come on, <laughs> call dat. Come on now, work with me. Thank you, thank you. Anybody ever seen one of those? I can tell you why you will never see them because God's putting in place genetic barriers that only like kinds can reproduce. Okay? It's as simple as that. And you don't have a monkey's uncle in your background. There's only 86% similarity between chimp DNA and human DNA. Now you would say, well, 86, that sounds like a lot. Yeah, but you don't know your genomes and your DNA. That's a gulf that cannot be breached. That 14% re represents a gazillion genome differences between chimps and humans. By the way, if you get more than three differences in your normal genetic chain, you die. Three. And I'm talking about a gazillion between you and a chimp. By the way, what's, what's the difference between a chimp and an ape? Who can tell me? It's real simple. Nope. Who said that? What'd you say? Booyah! <laughs> Great apes have no tails. Monkeys have tails. Okay. Now that's important for O-heads who remember our parents who served in World War II, especially in the Pacific, where they had tails going around that our grandfathers had tails. And the people walk up to, can I see your tail? Oh, you think I'm joking? Okay. All right, archeology, span that's that Indiana Jones stuff. The flood, the fossils ancient ruins, it's all right here in the Word of God available for you. Now the nature of science, everybody say with me, empirical science. Empirical science. That's the same thing as observational science. That's stuff that you can observe, test, repeat, make predictions, create things. Historical science is what you infer about the past. Quick English lesson. I'm doing the talking right now, right? So, I'm making the implications. You are listening to me and you are inferring what I'm saying. Follow me? I imply, you infer. How many people here are old enough to remember DOA? That's dead on arrival. I have a hand back there, right? The English professor, don't you remember that famous line? I imply, you infer. I, I, that was for free, by the way. We're going to take a look at this quick clip. Let's see what it's got to say on the nature of science. Have you ever like heard this. this? Billions of years ago, there was an explosion in space. Or 100,000 years ago, this happened or that happened. Or even in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Question, how does anyone know? I mean, was anybody there to observe it? Well, actually, somebody was, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Check this out. First of all, we need to recognize that there is a huge difference between observational science and historical science. Both are valuable, but very different. Let's define the two real quick, shall we? Observational science is simply when we observe something and experiment to draw conclusions. It involves repeatable experimentation and observations in the present. It's through observational science that we find cures for diseases and build space shuttles, stuff like that. Now, through historical science, we consider things that happened in the past, but they cannot be checked in the same way. I mean, we don't have access to the past like we do the present because, well, it's gone, right? All we really have is speculation, or at best, circumstantial evidences of past events based on what we see in the present. That's not to say that we can't make intelligent guesses about the past or form reasonable inferences from rocks or fossils in the present, but we certainly cannot directly test our conclusions because we cannot repeat the past. Got it? 
So, does that mean historical science is unimportant? Not at all. Let's drop an example down here for a minute and take a look at the Eiffel Tower. You know, that 19th century Parisian monument designed by Gustave Eiffel that stands 1,063 feet tall, which was built as the entrance for the 1889 World's Fair and is still the tallest building in Paris today, visited by millions of people each year? Yeah, that one. Well, guess what? Everything I just told you is true, but how do we test it? Well, applying observational science, we can, of course, observe the Eiffel Tower anytime we're in Paris. It's here in the present. Then we can continue by testing the height and comparing it to all the other structures in Paris and confirm the claim that it is indeed the tallest building in Paris. But that's the extent of the kind of facts that can be proved by observational science in reference to this claim. How do we really know that Gustav designed it? How do we really know it was built in the 19th century as an entrance to the 1889 World's Fair? How do we really know how many people visited? That's all in the past. It can't be repeated. For that kind of information, we need to go outside the limits of observational science and discover what has been communicated to us through historical documents and eyewitness accounts. And furthermore, we have to believe those eyewitnesses and documents are trustworthy. The same is true when we talk about the origin of the Earth. The Earth is here. We all agree with that. So, does observational science confirm that the world was created by God, and are there trustworthy documents and eyewitness accounts that confirm it? Well, let's take the last part first. In short, what we're really asking is my original question, was anybody there to observe it? The answer is yes. God was there, and he told us how he created. He inspired people to write down his very words that became books that were compiled into a complete book called the Bible, which has been verified over and over again and has demonstrated itself to be totally trustworthy in all it claims and teaches. Even secular scholars will concede that the Bible accurately records historical events. Anyway, we have the most trustworthy revelation from the most trustworthy eyewitness. Now, what about observational science? Does it confirm the Bible? Yes. And what's extremely important to realize is the observable fact that the universe is logical and orderly. That makes sense only if its creator is logical and has imposed order on his creation. It doesn't make sense at all if the universe is just an accident of a huge explosion. Also, our minds are able to comprehend many things about the universe, and that's only possible if the creator of the mind gave us the ability and desire to explore the universe. It doesn't make sense if our brains are byproducts of chance because we couldn't trust their conclusions to ever be accurate. And lastly, it only makes sense that we can observe and repeat an experiment if the universe consistently obeys the same laws from day to day, which only makes sense if a lawgiver created it that way and upholds it. So to be bluntly honest, science itself, whether observational or historical, is only possible because God exists and the Bible is true. I could go on, but enough said. Oh, y'all good today. That's outstanding. So I repeat, just for clarity's sake, God was there in the beginning. And he's given us his reliable document, the Bible, that explains all that he did in creation. And oh, by the way, science happens to agree with it. So in other words, God's word, say with me, God's word is true in everything it says. That means prophecies are fulfilled. Science of every shape and form is confirmed. And history is confirmed and accurate. Every historical event that the Word of God mentions is 100% accurate. Therefore, since it's inspired by God, that means it's God breathed. Say with me, the Word of God, word of God is, authoritative. is authoritative. That means it has authority over you. Amen. Amen. It is inerrant. That means there's no error. It's infallible. It never, ever, ever fails. How do you like that? And it is, watch this now, the standard for truth. Not your opinion. Not what you think. The Word of God is the standard for truth. See, because you have the Word of God, you understand what the meaning of life is. You have standards that don't shift from the left or the right. You understand that marriage is between a man and a woman, not... Adam and Steve, nor Eve and Evelyn. You have laws. You understand that six days equals God's word is authority. And oh, by the way, there is no such thing, look up here, as millions and billions of years. Human history, cosmic history, is literally about 6,000 years old. The days of creation are literal days. A 24-hour normal day cycle. Evening, morning, first day. Evening, morning, second day. Evening, morning. Are you with me? But if you're going to go with the morals 
a fall infallible man, you're going to have stuff like abortion and pornography and homosexual behavior and lawlessness. And that millions of years equals man is in authority. But students, as you are off in high school and college, somebody's going to ask you, somebody's going to challenge you. Well, if God is so good, because we say that a lot, right? I mean, we have the, our little Christian phrase, God is good, God is good all the time, blah, 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 right? Okay. If God is so good, why is there pain and suffering? Because somebody is going to challenge you about the character of God. Well, if your God is such a good guy, why is there pain and suffering? What do you say? I'm glad you asked. You hear these statements a lot. Every day something tragic happens. A child dies. Cancer takes another life. An earthquake kills thousands. It forces people to ask the question, if God is loving and merciful, why is there pain and suffering in the world? Well, that's a good question. And thankfully, the Bible sheds a lot of light on this subject. Check this out. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the declaration of the very first verse in the first book of the Bible, Genesis. The next couple of chapters explain in broad terms what God made over the course of the six literal days he used to complete his creation. Light, the sky, plants, animals, and humans. That's right. God created everything, and according to Genesis 131, he saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. That is, it was complete and perfect. There was no death and no suffering. There was no survival of the fittest. Animals didn't attack and eat each other. Adam and Eve, the first two humans, did not kill animals for food. Genesis 129 through 30 makes it clear that man and animals ate only fruits and vegetables. So the original creation was wonderful, peaceful, without death, full of life and joy, and all enjoying the presence of God, the Creator. So, what in the world happened? How do we get from there to here? Well, something drastic must have happened that altered the original creation, and that something was sin. Remember, God created a perfect world and placed Adam and Eve in paradise. As their creator, he had authority over them, and in his authority, God gave them a rule. In Genesis 2.17, God said, But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Well, Adam and Eve heard the rule loud and clear, but they willfully disobeyed it. They ate from the tree God told them not to. They chose to live by their rules and separate themselves from God. So the Creator kept His promise that punishment would follow their disobedience. With the rebellious act of one man, sin entered God's creation and death along with it. But the effects of sin didn't stop there. Because God had given dominion over all of creation to man, in a very real sense, the sin of man affected all of creation. In Genesis 3, we see the beginning of a cursed creation. Thorns and thistles were now part of the world, as well as pain and suffering and death. The world was no longer perfect. It was sin cursed. And that's why tragic things still happen today. And before we give Adam and Eve the full rap, we have to realize that all of us still willfully sin against God. That should make us really pause and think. But for now, at least on this topic, enough said. It's pretty sobering, isn't it? It's man's action that brought sin into the world and death along with it. There was a perfect world before that. Who's the oldest youth here today? Who's the oldest youth here today? Uh, besides our beloved pastor. Okay, I'm gonna pick somebody. Sir, would you please come up? Lauren? Come on down. <laughs> Give her a hand. Hi, Lauren. Hi. How are you? Good. How old are you? Nineteen. Whoa. Nineteen. We're going to do just like it's a game show, right? Okay? You're just going to pretend this is the mic. Lauren, uh, when you were five years old, would you agree with me that you pretty much knew right from wrong when you were five? She said, kind of. <laughs> well, Lauren, I'm going to take that as a yes. For the most part, okay, all right. Lauren, would you also agree with me that you probably did about five sins a day, thought word a deed when you were at least five years old? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So I need a volunteer to take out your smartphone. I just need one person. Who's, who's, that, who's that person going to be? All right. Multiply five times 365. Tell me what you get. What do you have, Sister Faison? 1,825 sins a year, Lauren. <laughs> Woo! 
and you're 19. So we're going to take 14 times 1,825, right? And the survey said... 25,000! Uh, we're not talking dollars here. 25,550? Lauren! 25,550 cents. So tell me, Lauren, tell our audience here today, have you done 25,551 righteous things to overcome the 25,550 sins that you've done? Definitely not. Definitely not an honest Hebrew. So Lauren, if you haven't done more righteous stuff, and it, really you can't, because it's pretty impossible. Would you agree with me you need a savior? Oh, yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> That's a big time yes, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Lauren, thank you so very much. You can have a seat. Give yeah. <laughs> When we're doing street corner evangelism, or just one-on-one -on -one relational evangelism, we call it salvation by numbers. I just run the numbers. I have yet to have one person ever say to me that they've done more righteous than they've done sin. And I say to that, sir, madam, I guess that means you need a savior, don't you? Seeing as you can't work your way to heaven, it's no good enough that you can do. Won't you repent of your sins and ask Jesus to save you right about now? You'd be surprised how many people say yes. Just run the numbers. Can't nobody beat that. Salvation by numbers. Lord Jesus, I, I usually take them to a straight salvation by Lord Jesus, I need you. I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe he arose again from the dead and paid my penalty for my sins. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me for all I have done wrong and save me. Save me right now. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> it is as simple as that. I would encourage you. Do that. Family, friends, co-workers, neighbors. Wherever God has your divine appointment, and it is a divine appointment. Run the numbers. It is an effective evangelical tool that has never failed. Amen? Amen. The answer is plain and simple. We messed up. God has provided the answer. And we need to repent and ask the Lord Jesus Christ to save us. By the way, when I'm usually doing that in middle schools and high schools, I get a number of hands that get raised that want to get saved. Multitudes. I do throw in there, you, you really don't want to bust hell wide open, do you? Okay, all right. Only Christ came to rescue us from our plight of death and destruction. Racist! Hoo-hoo! That's a hot topic, considering our current administration. Hmm. That's all I'm going to say about that. Question. As you know, this is very interactive today, right? How many races are there? You got to raise your hand. Don't yell out. Sir, I see that hand. Yes, sir, right here. One. One. Okay, anybody else? How many agree with the gentleman in the blue? You, you have to vote. You cannot abstain. All right? This is not a primary. All right? Well, let's find out what the Word of God has to say about that, shall we? I hear this one a lot. How can there be so many races in the world if we are all descendants of Adam and Eve? Well, check this out. First off, let's talk about the word race. Sometimes when people use the word, they mean supposed races of people who have evolved at different times, rates, and in different locations. That's not true. Of course, the word race is also a term we use to distinguish between groups with different physical traits, namely skin color. But are there really different races? Take a gander at Acts 17.26 where it is written that God, from one man, made every nation of men. It's clear then that the Bible teaches that there is one race, the human race. The Bible is also clear that all people on the earth 
are descendants of Adam and Eve who were created by God. Check Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Easy enough. God created two people in his image, male and female, and told them to increase in number. So Adam and Eve are mom and dad of the human race. Then their children had children and those children had children and so on and so forth for many generations until, according to Genesis 6, 9, the world's population was reduced to eight people who were protected inside an ark during a global flood. And those eight people later walked off the ark. And according to Genesis 9, 19, from them came the people who were scattered over the earth. Oh, wait a second. What do I mean scattered? Well, jump over to Genesis 11 and let's talk about an event known as the Tower of Babel. Basically, because of the sinful actions of the descendants of Noah, the Lord confused their language and scattered them from there over all the earth. That's pretty clear and concise. Okay, so we've got lots of people who are descendants of the eight folks who came off the ark, and now they have been scattered all over the earth. That explains that we are still one race and that different groups of people ended up in different locations. But how do we get a bunch of different colored people if we are all one race? Well, follow along. This, of course, is a simplified explanation, but the basic principles are true. We all have a pigment in our bodies called melanin, which, depending on different variables, produces different shades of the one main skin color we all possess. Several genes control the amount of melanin produced and thus the variability in the skin shade. In fact, it's easy for one couple to produce a wide range of skin shade variability in just one generation, as we'll see in just a moment. Time for a quick genetics lesson. DNA is the molecule of heredity that is passed from parents to children. A child inherits 23 chromosomes from each parent. Each chromosome pair contains hundreds of genes which regulate the physical development of the child. However, to illustrate basic genetic principles pertaining to the topic, we'll just talk about two genes, the genes that control the production of melanin. So let capital A and capital B symbolize versions of the gene that code for large amounts of melanin, while little a and little b code for small amounts. Got it? Easy. Check this out. Take a look at the upper left. Let's say dad contributes capital A, capital B genes, and mom contributes capital A, capital B genes as well. Together they will produce a child with capital A, capital A, capital B, and capital B. This is a kid with a lot of melanin, and thus he will have very dark skin. Easy to see. Here's the bigger point though. Let's say dad contributes capital A, capital B, and mom contributes little a and little b. Well, the child's skin will be middle brown shade, the combination of capital A, little a, and capital B, little b, which by the way represents a majority of the world's population. Not only that, but if each parent is capital A, little a, capital B, little b, the combinations that could be produced in their children could result in a very wide range of skin shades in just one generation. Ooh. So, since Adam and Eve were the first people ever, it makes sense to conclude that God placed in them a combination of genes that could produce all different shades of skin we see. Those same combinations would be present in Noah and the seven other people who boarded the ark. And because God dispersed people at the Tower of Babel, he dispersed the population, thereby isolating gene pools in the different people groups. Over time, different cultures formed in different locations with certain features like skin shade becoming predominant. And here we are today. And since we all go back to Noah and his family, it makes sense that we are all different shades of brown. One race, multiple people groups, just like the Bible teaches. Simplified for sure, but enough said. <laughs> So the biblical view is Adam and Eve. And by the way, they had a bunch of kids. Genesis 5, 4. Literally, the Hebrew idiom is that they had a troop. Sons and daughters. Noah and his sons. How many sons did Noah have? Three. Three. And their names are? Outstanding. And of course, it's 150 years after they get off that very large ocean-going vessel. And they get dispersed at the ziggurat or tower of Babel. So the $64,000 question is, what color was Adam and Eve's skin? Middle brown. <laughs> you mean like Doit? <laughs> Shades of skin, lots and lots. Capital A, capital B, small A and small B for small amounts, right? The science is real simple on this. If Adam and Eve only had small a and small b, they could only produce kids that would look like that. If they had capital A and capital B, they could only produce kids that look like that. Obviously, that lacks genetic variation. However, if they have capital A, small a, capital B, small b, they're going to produce kids that look like that. Boom. Which is exactly what you have on the planet. Listen to me very carefully. Everybody look up here. There is no such thing as Caucasian, Negroid, Mongoloid, Australiaoid. There isn't. Those terms were made up by 16th century British anthropologists and sociologists at the request of the British Crown. You remember your history. The sun never sets on the British Empire. I want to make the whole world 
British, right? They needed a justification for the imperialistic actions against the rest of the world. Amen? This is what the Word of God says. Say this with me. Tribes. Tribes. Tongues. Tribes. Nations. Nations. People groups. That is biblical anthropology. Most of you are sons and daughters of Ham. Some of you are sons and daughters of Shem. Some of you are sons and daughters of Japheth. More importantly, it makes all of us cousins. Yes, she is. But she's a distant cousin. Which is why you're able to marry her. That one was for free also. Okay? See, once you get it biblically straight, it gets rid of any prejudices or biases or bigotry you might have. Because God holds you responsible for what you know and do. All right? Look, I wasn't in the household of a bunch of people that got raised with some terrible worldviews. But I was raised in a biblical household. And since I've grown up and I do this sort of thing as a living, I understand. Where's that young lady? There you are. You got your degree, right? What's up, cuz? <laughs> Don't you treat family different? Did somebody you meet in Wawa? Don't you? Look, I would hope so. All right? Well, get used to the fact that the whole world is your family. Amen? Amen. Y'all ain't convinced. Amen? Amen. Let's take I'm gonna, here's what I'm going to do because I need to wrap this up in about 10 minutes or so, right? Are you, are you, give, are you giving me liberty, Pastor? <laughs> this is a dangerous thing. <laughs> this is a quickie. After the flood, Noah and his family gave thanks and offered sacrifices to God for preserving them. God told Noah to go and multiply and fill the earth. Noah's family flourished and multiplied, but they did not spread all over the earth. Instead, they moved down from the mountains of Ararat and settled in the plain of Shinar and dreamed of building a great city. Come, let us build a city and a tower to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, looked down upon them and saw you, the city girl. and the tower they were building. They are united and speak the same language. Now nothing they imagine to do will be impossible for them. So God went down and confused their language so they could not understand each other. And God scattered them over the face of the earth, and they stopped building the city. They left Babel by foot, by cart, and by boat. Because of the language barriers, each family group became isolated and developed distinct physical traits and cultures. came from the three sons of Noah, so they all share the same genes and all share the same promise of the Savior, the seed which God promised to Adam in the Garden of Eden. I have to restrain myself from dancing to that. I mean, you know, I get to moving up here. <laughs> You'll be like, that's not a holy dance, brother. Come on now, chill on that. So, the dispersion at the tower, you're going to have isolation of specific gene pools that accounts for the outward differences. There's only 0.2% difference between any human being on the planet. So, 
your thinking in every area should be dominated by the word of God. It'll make your history and scientific understanding sustainable. There's only two starting points, and you don't need to, young people, old people, anybody in between, never ever be ashamed of a biblical starting point. Because see, there's someone who knows everything about everything, who's always been there, who never tells a lie, and who reveals to us the information we need to have to come to right conclusions about the universe and ourselves. That's why the scriptures testify in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. Who is the him? Jesus. It's talking about Jesus the Christ. All right, Colossians. And it's real clear. Although all three are involved, the main person of the Godhead that's involved in creation is the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, you and I are accountable to him. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was? Say it. He was with God in the beginning, and through him, how many things were made? Without him, nothing was made that has been made. But about the Son, he says in Hebrews 1, 8 through 12, your throne will last forever and ever. That's right, say it loud. And righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated witness. Therefore, God has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. Oh, I get excited about this. He also says in the beginning, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. We're working with something. Now they will perish, but... They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment. They will be changed, but you remain the same and your years will never end. <clears throat> because I'm, I'm affiliated with NASA and I do this NASA and this STEM stuff, I can actually tell you when it's talking about rolling up space, that's a reality because space is an elastic solid. It's not some empty void. Because God talks about about 17 or 18 times in Scripture, he stretches out the heavens, which he literally does or did. Okay? By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen is not made out of what was visible. In Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead or deity bodily. There's are the patriarchs, and from then it's traced the human history of Christ, who is? I can't hear you. Overall, forever praised. Amen. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of our Savior. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, priest among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. Literally, y'all should be up on your feet going, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are and what you did. Woo! In Christ draws all the fullness of the God. Here we hit that. He's the image of the invisible God. The firstborn is not talking about the order, but the preeminence over all creation. For by him all things created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible thrones, dominions, principalities, power, all things were created through him and for him, and is before all things, and in him all things consist. The idea of that Greek word is that he holds it all together by the strength and the power of his hand. Come on up here. I need one more volunteer. I need another young person. It's you this time. Come on. No, no, I still need you. Okay. You stand right here. You stand right here. Okay. I need, I need an old head now. <laughs> I, I do. I need, I need, I need an old head. Anyone? Come on, come on. Come on, come on. Just like in the game show, quickly, quickly. All right. Okay, I need you over here on this side. All right, remember I just said all things consist by him. He holds it all together by the strength and power of his hand. Okay. You, sir, are subatomic. In fact, you're the nucleus of an atom, right? Proton, proton, neutron. Okay. Protons have what type of charge? 
Thank you very much. And as positive charge, y'all should be doing what? Attracting or repelling each other? Repelling. That's what that means, right? Sign language. Okay, I got it. All right. Neutrons, they're neutral. So they just kind of hang around. Okay. Subatomic. What's keeping your cells from exploding based on the scripture we just read? <laughs> Not you, them. <laughs> the contestants that are up front. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> what show is that that they asked the audience for their answers? Okay, all right. The new Okay. <laughs> God is the one that holds you together at the subatomic level to keep you from flying apart, literally, and destroying yourselves because of his great power and his great love for you. Isn't that worth a round of applause for Jesus? Thank you. Thank you so very much. And to make all people see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the mystery, by the way, means it's just something that hasn't been told. It's not an Agatha Christie mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. Now tell them the truth. How many of you really knew that scripture in Ephesians 3, 9 was there? Raise your hand. That's what I thought. Besides the pastor, keep your hand down. All right. I expect you to know, sir. <laughs> You're the shepherd of the flock. But how many of you really knew that was there? That clearly says the Father made everything through Jesus Christ. Besides all the other scriptures. See what I'm saying? We're nailing something down here that you will never ever forget. Looking for the blessed hope and glory superior of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. I am the Alpha and the Omega. If I was doing the full version, we would have started in the Old Testament and ran it up through. But we don't have time for that. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I'm trying to get you to look at Jesus like you ain't never looked at him before. He's the one to put 100 billion galaxies with 200 billion stars in each one by average in one day. Does that sound like omnipotence to you? Does that really sound like omnipotence to you? All right, then why are you sweating that problem? Oh, you didn't expect me to go there. <laughs> Why are you full of anxiety and worry about this, that, and the other? The same God that could do that, and really he could have just did it like that. That's a Thanos snapping him. For my kids out there that know the Marvel Cinematic Universe, right? Okay? He could have did it just like that. Why are you sweating? Those issues. Place your trust and care and your anxieties in him. Because he tenderly and affectionately cares for you. See, fallen, fallible man doesn't know everything, he hasn't always been there, who doesn't always tell the truth, tries to figure out the universe while rejecting the God of the Bible and his revelation in his word. Because there's two worldviews. Naturalism versus supernaturalism. All right? You're going to have to go on one side or the other. See, God's word has always been under attack since the beginning of history. When Satan tempted Eve, he questioned what God said. Did God really say that, girl? Come on now. He holding out on you. These attacks have continued throughout time. In each case, the truth of God's magnificent word has prevailed. So you will have no reason to worry about when you hear new questions about the accuracy of God's word. It's going to prevail. Okay? Just as it always has. Watch this. Corn is a mythical horse-like animal with a single horn growing from its forehead. This is a depiction of a unicorn. This animal is mythical. It's fictional. It's make-believe. It's not real. There's none of these alive today and no scientist has ever found a fossil of one. And yet unicorns are mentioned in the Bible nine times in the books of Numbers, Deuteronomy, Job, Psalms, and Isaiah. And so because of this, people like to scoff at the Bible and say things like this. So, now if you believe in God, you believe in unicorns. Which is fantastic. If we're going to use the Bible for science, we've got some tough things to explain. What are you going, what are you going to do about uh, unicorns? We're mentioned eight times in the Bible. I want to tell you what, we have never found a fossil of a unicorn. 
By the way, where are the unicorns that are referred to in the Bible? Where, where are those, either in the fossil record or today? I'd like to see one of those. Another one of those interesting tests that continues to get failed. Well, if you get an old 1828 Noah Webster's Dictionary, which is the very first edition dictionary that Webster came out with about 200 years ago, and if you look at the word unicorn, it says that unicorn is an animal with one horn, the monoceros. This name is often applied to the rhinoceros. Notice how this definition says absolutely nothing about a horse. It says nothing about a horse-like animal or a mythical animal or a fictitious creature. It says absolutely nothing about Greek mythology whatsoever, but rather it says that this is a name that is often applied to the rhinoceros. Wait a minute. What? The rhinoceros? You mean this is a unicorn? Yes. But the rhinoceros has two horns. How could this be a unicorn? Well, if you look up the word rhinoceros in the same dictionary, it says that rhinoceros is a genus of quadrupeds of two species, one of which... The unicorn has a single horn growing almost erect from the nose. This animal, when full grown, is said to be 12 feet in length. There's another species with two horns, the bicornis. They're natives of Asia and of Africa. According to Noah Webster, back in the early 1800s, it was